Um, thank you. Um, so I, I think I said to Claire when uh, she asked me what I, what I did and what I, wanted to, what I was going to say for this presentation, um, who I was, um, said something like, um, I like to treat the internet like the kind of virtual shed at the bottom of my non-existent garden, um, which actually is kind of a load of rubbish because it doesn't really mean anything and I'm kind of very sorry for the, the whole shed analogy. Um, so, um, I'm, um, I'm an engineer, I guess. I am the one person in the engineering department for uh, the really interesting group. Um, we're a collection of freelancers who, I guess we, um, we try and work on interesting projects. Um, there's a sales and marketing department, it's also one person, and there's a design department, which is also one person. Um, I like to kind of treat making things as a kind of form of expression, I guess. I find it really difficult talking about stuff in kind of quite abstract manners. Um, I like to kind of make something so that I can kind of point at it and have a discussion around it and kind of show it to somebody and say, you know, what do you think? What does this kind of embody? What are the ideas and the principles? Um, and as somebody who makes something, I find it, um, I find making things on the web really empowering because the web has completely changed, as Alan's just talked about, all of the kind of rules of communication, all the rules of group forming and stuff that we've kind of um, had for the last, you know, thousands of years. The web enables you to kind of build upon other people's buildings and to steal stuff and to kind of glue it together in different ways and to create new things and then for other people to build on top of those. Um, and the web enables uh, an organisation like ours to be, um, to basically punch above our weight, to be much more powerful and have much more influence than we ever could before. Um, we can, as a, you know, a group of three people, produce things, um, we can produce millions of objects, we can send those things out into the world and those can have some kind of impact on people. Or we can build something which kind of delights and inspires some people. And it also enables us to kind of stay sort of small and nimble and to not have that kind of bloat of larger organisations. Now, I don't know about you, but and I think Alan's kind of alluded to some of this stuff as well, but there's so many difficult decisions ahead. It's so difficult working out what you should be doing on a kind of day-to-day -day basis. Presented with sort of so many choices, you know, nuclear power, is that good or bad? You know, that kind of thing. And th th these are, you know, much smaller decisions than that. Um, and I kind of, I get a bit stuck, to be honest. Um, and I kind of always come back to this, def this kind of default opinion that um, delighting and inspiring people is always good. Like, it's just kind of a baseline good. You can't really go wrong with it. And so I, I guess I'm kind of good at data. I kind of understand how to use data and how to use that to have an effect on people. And so that's kind of what I do. Um, this is something I made uh, last year. This is... Um, basically megaliths.iamnear.net and the idea is that you're kind of bored and you could pull out like a restaurant finder or something like that and that's kind of what you know Starbucks and co would like you to do um, or you could you know pull out your phone and see where the nearest megalith is and there's quite a few nearby um, and you could just go and you know yomp off and find it and it was just trying to kind of spin something spin a technology which is so um, which kind of is, is you know is now in everyone's pocket into something that's just a little bit more delightful and a little bit more engaging and just have an effect on somebody. Um, this is another thing. This is a, um, so it turns out NASA track all of the kind of asteroids that are flying towards the Earth. Um, and this is something which uh, is basically, it, it takes the data from NASA and every time an asteroid flies by the Earth, it tweets. Um, and it's just kind of like this little reminder that like, you know, it's pretty fragile out there and it's kind of, it's just uh, quite a nice way of keeping things in perspective. Now, there's quite a lot of um, changes happening with technology. There's a lot of technologies converging, which are um, quite interesting. So computing and networking is starting to become embedded in just about everything. It's becoming so cheap to put a chip in something or to connect it to the web. And I'm really interested in using that. And so there's a, kind of, there's a few different parts about how people kind of might develop these things. And one of these is something like this. This is um, 
a demo of the Microsoft Surface, which is this big table. The possibilities seem endless as the line between the virtual world and the physical world becomes increasingly thin. Turning friends on to new music will one day be done with the greatest of ease. And it will happen on a table that lets us share our photos with the flick of a wrist. That's cool, you know, it's quite cool. Um, and there's also stuff like um, this. This is kind of a demo of a thing called uh, augmented reality. The idea being that your phone has a camera, it knows where you are, it knows where you're pointing, and thus it can kind of overlay like information about the world on the screen in front of you. So as you kind of pick up your phone, move around, this is all the tube stations in um, London, um, and you can see where they are. Um, and you, I mean, that's interesting, like it's clever technology. But you go to a conference and you look at sort of two things. There, there's the Microsoft Surface table, and you know, that's cool. And there's this thing. And all it does is when you, um, when you say its name on Twitter, it blows bubbles. <laughs> and what you'll find is there's the Microsoft Surface table, which costs sort of 10,000 pounds. And there's a group of geeks all trying to get this thing to blow bubbles. And it's just amazing. Like, it's just kind of, it just produces a delightful effect in the world. This is another thing I quite like, which is uh, just a kind of a, uh, a clock that's been kind of repurposed into a kind of device which shows you where um, this guy John, who made it, is in the world, or, you know, between sort of four places. Um, and he just sort of has it on his mantelpiece for his family. And it's just kind of, <laughs> it's, you know, it's dead simple, and it just fits into your life, and you kind of, you know, it, it sort of, you can see why somebody might want something like that, even if you don't necessarily agree with the kind of location tracking part of it, you've got to be interested in the fact that it's just cool, like it's just kind of fun. Um, so this is a little thing that I built uh, sort of in January, February time. Um, I call it the kind of micro printer, and basically all it is is a receipt printer connected to the web, and every now and again um, it goes onto the web and says, have I got any messages to print? Yes, I'll print them. And it, you know, that message comes out and you tear it off. Um, it's, you know, it, I, it was made in probably about half a day, maybe, maybe a little bit more. Um, and it's, you know, the receipt printer was second hand off eBay, it cost 30 pounds, something like that. And the idea is that um, I wanted to kind of like a, a daily status report for my kind of life, something I could sort of rip out and tear with, sort of take with me. It didn't involve kind of fiddling with the iPhone and, you know, the calendar and all this other stuff that was a bit slow. This is something that it, it's printed onto a seat. You can stick it in your, po stick it in your wallet. Um, you already have lots of receipts in your wallet. Like it's, you know, it, it, it fits there and it's, it's the right kind of shape and size. Um, and that kind of thing was made possible from, by this, which is uh, an Arduino, which is basically just a little prototyping board um, which lets you basically, um, you know, try out um, uh, at putting these building blocks together into something new and spitting that out into the world in, you know, with a printer or something. Um, again, it's kind of you know, plugging these blocks together and building upon them and let somebody else then build upon that. You know, in turn, I kind of released all of the information that I'd learned about this thing and now there are about 10, 15 of these things in the world and people kind of want to know how can they, how can they make them. So in, in 1985, the um, Apple Laser Writer uh, came out. Um, it was $6,995. Um, it's, it was the first kind of mass market uh, laser printer. So you can buy a laser printer nowadays from you know, Amazon or whatever for uh, 50 pounds. This costs about $5,000 today, and this is a 3D printer. Um, and that might give you some kind of idea of where the next 20 years might head. Um, this basically is a, a way of printing that um, lets you basically build up a layers and layers and layers of an object by kind of depositing kind of plastic um, resin or cornstarch on top of them so you build up an object. And it's a bit, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit funny, like it's not, you know, it's, it's not perfect, it's a bit kind of, everything's kind of white and it's, you know, it's a bit kind of form, it's a bit kind of textureless and stuff. But it, it seems like it's kind of, there's a glimmer there of something. Um, 
This is a 3D printer that can print a 3D printer. Um, that's the parent on the left, obviously, and the child on the right. Um, the only thing they've added are the, the metal kind of support bars, which are kind of available kind of anywhere. And the idea being that, I mean, you know, this is kind of stupid, and you probably wouldn't want to leave it on. You might come back to a kind of room full of 3D printers. But it, <laughs> it, it's, a, you know, it's a glimmer. There's something there about kind of fabrication and um, producing things. Um, there's, a, there's a service in the US called Shapeways, which basically kind of... Um, Let's you uh, go onto their site and upload a design, a 3D design, and um, print it out, and they will send it to you in the post. Um, and it, you know, this a bit kind of, it's a bit niche. Like, there's a lot of kind of uh, jewelry on there, and there's a lot of um, kind of model making kit, kind of Warhammer type stuff and things. But you know, there's a glimmer there of something which is interesting about being able to produce things completely bespoke. Um, without having to have bought into any infrastructure, without having to tooled up a factory. And that seems quite exciting. You can do things like this is a, this is a design for, a, the, the, I think, a, a buggy that won kind of the moving parts competition they have. Um, and it sort of turned into that. It's a little toy. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not um, very exciting in itself. But there's a glimmer there. And I think it's the kind of glimmer we saw with something like, back in kind of 1994 with something like GeoCities, where it was the first kind of web publishing platform which anyone could use. Before, you kind of pretty much, you had to buy a server, and if you didn't, you had to put that server in a data center, and you had to run, learn how to run that server, and you had to have somebody to administer that server, and et cetera. And GeoCities made it possible, despite the fact it's a, it was a bit weird. It was full of animated GIFs, and it was all really ugly pages, and it was a lot of experimentation. It made it really easy for people to just stick stuff online to get going with publishing. And arguably, kind of GeoCities and things like that kind of led to Blogger and the services which we now kind of can sign up for in seconds and instantly have things online. And I'm not saying everyone's going to want to produce bespoke things. Um, not in the same way that not everyone wants to produce a blog. But it feels like that's made, that has had a cultural kind of impact. And it feels like Shapeways and the 3D printing stuff will probably do the same. And so all of this kind of 3D printing and sort of fabrication and personal uh, publishing stuff kind of got us thinking a little bit uh, as the really interesting group. And so um, it turns out it's really easy to make newspapers. And as kind of... Uh, readers move online, and so does all the advertising revenues. The newspaper printing presses are kind of crying out for people to use them. And it's actually, you can do a kind of short run on a printing press for not a lot of money. So my two colleagues kind of made this. Um, it's, it was a Christmas present for some friends. It was basically a collection of stuff that, people, that they'd written over the year, um, packaged up into something nice to give them at Christmas. And, you know, we've got long form kind of blog posts in there. Um, and it was quite nicely laid out. Like it was uh, Ben, a graphic designer, did kind of all of the design. Um, and we're not trying to kind of ape the kind of newspaper kind of uh, look and feel. Like we're trying to actually kind of just do something different with it. It feels, we, we, in, in a few experiments, kind of Ben found that it was quite empty if you didn't have something like across the top at the, as the header where you'd normally have um, the kind of the, the name of the newspaper and the uh, volume and issue number. Um, so they just kind of put like loads of people's um, sort of Twitter messages in there instead. And that kind of seemed to fit. It was quite, it was quite, it sort of worked quite well. Um, and you can do completely, you know, things with a design that you can never do with a normal newspaper. And a lovely kind of centerfold picture of NASA Space Center. And the goal was to kind of, for them to print 50. But it turns out that the minimum you can colour print is about a thousand, so they did it anyway. I made a limited edition kind of run of a thousand, and anyone could kind of come to our website and um, you could stick in your, your your name and your address, and we'd post you one until we ran out. Um, and so we were sending that, like we were packaging them for like two weeks, sending them all over the world to kind of Chile and Japan and pretty much every country I'd heard of. And we started thinking again about this. And we started thinking, what kind of service could you wrap around the newspaper printing presses to, um, to make it easier for people to do what we did? And so this is what we're working on now. Um, 
This is something called Newspaper Club, which is um, basically a really simple tool to let people kind of gather content online, blog posts, uh, photos, articles, and to just kind of plop them onto a page and to send it to us, and we'll print it for you. And you get to hit print on this. It's quite a machine. <laughs> And so you kick off this amazing kind of industrial process. And it's just kind of fantastic. And we're not kind of trying to destroy the newspaper industry. Like, they're doing a good enough job of that themselves. Um, <laughs> but we're trying to kind of just use the infrastructure they're leaving behind. And it seems like there's, there's quite a lot of infrastructure being abandoned all over the place. Newspapers are not going to be the first business that gets broken so hard by the <laughs> web. Um, what comes next, I don't know. But it seems like we should be looking out for kind of these blocks of 20th century infrastructure and retooling them for the 21st century in a participatory um, manner, just as Alan was talking about. But there's a new set of skills that we need to learn in order to do this. Um, for me, anyway, as somebody who's come from a kind of a digital background, um, we need to kind of, I, I, you know, I had to kind of spool up pretty quickly on kind of distribution and logistics and supply chains and all of this stuff. Like the new rules of thumb, you know, I, as an engineer, I'm kind of used to rules of thumb and stuff. Like that's kind of 5,000 newspapers. Back of your car is about 1,000 newspapers. Like these are kind of things you need to kind of learn if you're going to kind of uh, actually start pushing atoms around instead of pushing electrons. And, you know, this is what kind of 2,000 newspapers looks like in your hallway. Um, but, and, and sometimes like, the cost of distribution is sometimes higher than actually even making the thing. But the, there's a big kind of sustainability elephant in the kind of corner, um, which I, I, I just want to touch on, really. Um, I think first you kind of need to acknowledge that um, there's a kind of hidden cost to, to servers and stuff as well, as well as kind of producing real things. Um, the, web, the online is not always kind of better. Um, and th th there's even some research out there by a, a, s a Swedish technology group that actually suggests reading news in newspapers actually uh, has, a has a lower carbon impact. Um, but and also, paper has the opportunity to be really sustainable because it, you know, it, it can actually come from completely renewable forests, and if the supply chain is carefully managed and it's the, the forestry is carefully managed then there's an opportunity for that to actually be much better than all of these server farms we have humming away in you know, uh, Greenwich or um, Docklands or somewhere. And 3D printing, I, I, I don't know, it's, it's, kind of, it's, it's a difficult one. And I hope people are kind of working on the kind of sustainability aspect of that. Because um, we don't just want to end up with like, the same thing as we've got now, but just with loads of it, just all in kind of white plastic. It'd be terrible. And so I guess there's only there's, there's two things I want to um, take you to take away with you. Um, in the rush to kind of digital and everything we're seeing now, don't f kind of forget the power of analog. Don't forget what it's like to hold something in your hand and to be kind of just amazed and delighted by such a simple effect. Um, there's this kind of classic William Gibson quote which says um, uh, that um, oh, that's the Arthur C. Clarke quote that says. Um, Sufficiently fast, it's just su sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Well, actually, like really, really simple stuff in the real world is also completely indistinguishable from magic as well. People ask us all the time, "How did you make those newspapers?" You're like, "Well, you've seen newspapers before, yeah? It's just, <laughs> it's just like that, like you know." And if you are going to design these things that kind of cross both worlds, that are kind of bleed between in analog and digital stuff, then you've got to kind of um, to try and hook them together so that you use the best of both worlds, so that they, um, so that they are kind of they, they play off both the advantages of each of those worlds, um, and that they can kind of bleed between the two worlds. That you can kind of, um, you know, the simplest example is like newspapers. Start putting like website addresses in your newspaper. I want to be able to share that thing I just read on the in, in the newspaper with a friend. Like it's just really simple stuff. 
and the, I, we were trying to work out kind of what the what the kind of the message was, I guess, like the, the one-liner. And I guess it's kind of don't just put the world into the web, but put the web into the world. And there's also there's another kind of thing. Um, big machines are not evil. Like what people do with them can be, so it can be evil. But big machines themselves can be, when used carefully, incredibly powerful. So seize the means of production, like make things, because it's never been easier to produce things at scale to have cultural impact. And that's it. Thank you.